Hello everybody, how's it going? Ben Gothard here with another Project Egg interview. And today we're talking to Jonathan Lacoste from Ohio. How you doing today, Jonathan? Hey, good, Ben. How are you? Good, man. Fantastic. Thanks for asking. Thank you so much for coming on the show. So, Jonathan, my first question for you is, what is your story? Let's see. So, uh, as you just mentioned, grew up in Ohio, uh, played hockey uh, pretty frequently. So, I was traveling all over uh, the Midwest and uh, <clears throat> the country, to be honest, and uh, fell in love with Boston and the East Coast uh, during those travels. So, uh, when it came down to uh, junior, senior year, trying to decide where I was going to go, um, the decision was pretty clear. So, ended up going to uh, Boston College uh, in Boston. Um, and as a part of that, uh, my freshman year before I stepped foot on campus, um, you know how you have to go through the housing process. Um, I was trying to apply for a uh, like a special living uh, house. It's a leadership program, and the guy who was interviewing me um, ended up uh, becoming my co-founder in Jebit. He essentially had just finished a business plan competition. We started uh, to talk about that, and uh, long story short, uh, went to BC and uh, and met my co-founder Tom. Um, so from there, we, uh, we started this company called Jebit. Um, we went through the business plan competition at Boston College at the time, ended up winning. We spent a year and a half trying to build out the business in school. And uh, about four and a half years ago, crazy it's that long, four and a half years ago, <laughs> we, uh, we ended up dropping out and uh, leaving school and have just been building the business since then. So that's the brief version. That's awesome, man. That's awesome. So, you know, I want to dig a little bit into your history. So, you know, from a from an early age, you know, what what kind of childhood did you have? You know, what more more on the personal side of, of Jonathan, you know, who who were you as a little kid and, and you know, maybe you could give a little bit of insight in that period of your life. Yeah, absolutely. Um very gregarious, outgoing. Um, you know, up until I was about twelve years old, I lived in the same house and uh uh, we were friends with all the kids in the neighborhoods. We had kind of our a bunch of families that were really tight together. And then I think my childhood kind of changed because um, uh, I started to move about every nine months to a year for hockey, right? Either, you know, moving up a level or getting traded or, or kind of going from from house to house. Um, so that kind of changed me. And I think it was a very positive impact. Um, but I think it made you mature and grow a little bit earlier uh, as a kid. I remember being 13 years old, living in other people's houses. Um, you know, it's called billet families in hockey. Um, you know, uh, helping raise my two little brothers at times when my dad wasn't able to move out with us. So it's just kind of like those life experiences as a, as a kid when you're 13 and 14, and all you want to do is, you know, maybe hang out with friends and play video games. That uh, that changed a little bit. But um, overall, um, I'd say up until high school, uh, was very social, very active, uh, outgoing. Um, you know, and then in high school, it became very kind of like a disciplined, uh, rigorous approach. Uh, my dad comes from kind of like a military family. So he, he instituted the, uh, the discipline side of it and helped me make sure I, I got through everything, sports, academics, and, you know, whatever time was left for, uh, for girlfriend or, uh, friends after that. So, um, yeah, it was fun. Absolutely. Now you mentioned being a little bit outgoing and, and social growing up. Well, do you think that that has had any impact on your entrepreneurial journey? Uh, and if so, maybe you could talk about that a little bit. Yeah, I think that's a great question. I think you don't inherently have to be an extrovert or an introvert to be an entrepreneur. I think you can be either or. I think the entrepreneurship journey, if anything, has taught me that I might be more introverted than extroverted. I think you have to have social skills and you have to be able to connect with people because entrepreneurship is so much about convincing people that your crazy idea or vision can become a reality. So part of it is having that human connection to get other people on board to join your project and, or, or business and what you're doing. And then it's also, you know, first time investors, first customers, you know, first partnership. So there's a lot of convincing you have to do. And so naturally someone within your early group should be good at going out and trying to tell a story and talk about what the potential here is. But at the same time, I kind of use that extrovert introvert um, angle because I think entrepreneurship um, is so taxing at times because you're always on, you know, you're always trying to, uh, you know, communicate with employees or investors or customers or potential customers that by the end of the day, most of the time, what I, I used to do to unwind was go hang out with friends or, or go out. Now I just want to watch a YouTube video and fall asleep, you know, or, or catch up on Netflix. So um, so yeah, I think to answer your question, it absolutely had an impact on my ability to hopefully, uh, connect with others. Um, but I think it's also taught me a little bit about, you know, 
maybe the more introverted side of me as well. So, absolutely, absolutely. So, you know, you talked about how kind of from an early age you had to, to take on a level of maturity in order to to you know stay at that high level of performance. Um, can you talk a little bit about the importance of maturity in entrepreneurship? Yep. Yeah, I think I think it's one of the most important things to be honest, because at the end of the day, everyone, all eyes are on you, right? So entrepreneurship is, as you've heard the cliche in startups, is it's really a roller coaster, right? There, there's a bunch of different uh, analogies you can use, but um, the the highs and lows for entrepreneurs are literally on an hour by hour basis. You know, you come out of a great meeting and you think the biggest customer ever is going to sign with you. And then you, you know, walk out of uh, into another meeting and a huge investor decides they're not going to invest. And then you walk into another meeting and it's a great meeting with an employee and they're in a really good spot and you're just really proud of them and they're killing it. And then you walk in another meeting and, uh, you know, one of your big customers isn't doing well and is thinking about leaving. So literally on a day by day basis, you know, the highs and lows. And so, I think what's really important and how I think about it is just not to get too low and not to get too high, just to kind of stay in that zone. And, and getting back to your question, kind of the ability to have maturity uh, to stay in that zone and then uh, emulate that in the office or around your peers or, or colleagues or coworkers, whoever you're with at the time, even if it's just you and your other founder, um, is really important. Um, going back to the early days, uh, Tom and I always try to balance each other out, right? So if, if one person was a little high or, or was a little low, the other person tried to, even if they felt low as well, to balance it out and, 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 and be more on the high end. So I think it, that all comes with maturity as you grow and, you know, nothing new that you don't know already. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. So, you know, you, you talked about that balance between you and, and your co-founder. And I think that that's a really important um, thing to talk about, you know, an important concept. Can you talk a little bit about um, your strengths versus your, your co-founder's strengths and, and how you all really do balance each other out? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think the easiest way to oversimplify it is I'm a little bit more detail uh, and like execution focused. Um, so uh, he's really good at, um, I think the best thing that Tom does is, is team and culture. So getting everyone in a room, regardless of the ups and downs, to understand why we're here, the mission, and kind of, you know, all rowing in the same direction, so to speak, as in, in the crew analogy. Um, and then when it comes time to figure out, okay, where do we go or how do we get it done? Um, that's where I try to jump in and help out um, with maybe a little bit more on the organizational side. So um, it's a perfect balance, though. You're going to have different skill sets as co-founders, but I think what's most important is a shared set of values. Um, so he and I value the most, uh, you know, important things. We we agree on that, and those things look like, uh, you know, work ethic and dedication, how you should carry yourself in the office, um, how you treat employees, uh, you know, what the ultimate goal of the company is. Like, there are some non-negotiables that you want to make sure you and your co-founder uh, agree with. So, absolutely, absolutely. So, you know, you were saying you're more of the technical execution, get stuff done uh, side. Well, how did you recognize that? Because I think. Um, as as leaders and as entrepreneurs, it's really important to be self aware. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. I was reading this book called uh, Strength Based Leadership by by Tom Rath the other day, and 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 the gentleman was saying that you've got to figure out what your strengths are. So how did you find yours? To be honest, the only way you really truly know is to kind of just put yourself out there and, and give it a try, right? Um, so I think early on in entrepreneurship, my my co founder and I and any set of co founders are kind of doing a little bit of everything. Right. I mean, when there's only two people building the company, you physically have to do everything. Um, but when we I like what you said about self-awareness, because that's something that Tom and I in particular try to always have is just being really intellectually honest with each other and, and agreeing that any negative feedback we give isn't a personal slight. It's for the betterment of the company. Right. So if Tom comes to me and says, hey, I don't think this particular area, you know, you're good at it. But, you know, compared to my skill set, I may be better at it. Um, I have to take that with a grain of salt and say, you know what, you're right for the betterment of Jeb and for the business. I think that's something that you should lead on. Um, and then in particular, I think um, it became pretty evident pretty quickly who tended to be more or organized or, or, or tended to, to like those types of things. So I was happy to step up and help out. So <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. So, you know, I want to talk a little bit about discipline. Uh, and, and you mentioned, I believe, that your father came from a military uh, background. Uh, and so, you know, that, that must have been instilled from a, from a pretty early age, but how important is discipline? And if you don't have it, 
How can you truly develop it? Yeah, um, incredible question. I think personally, it's one of my beliefs that that's the key to success. Um, so uh, he wasn't in the military himself, but his father was. And so he grew up in a military household. And so they moved around a lot as part of the Air Force and different air bases. They lived in Germany for a period of time. So I think just um, he, he and I actually shared a very similar um, childhood in terms of always being uprooted and moving around and different things. Um, but in terms of discipline, here's kind of how I think about it. Um, success, a lot of the times you can be lucky and be successful, but the best way to be successful is just to be as consistent as possible uh, and, and consistent at a high level uh, of, of activity, uh, whatever it is you're doing. Um, and the best way to be consistently good at something, um, you know, coming in every day and just giving it your best effort um, is if you have discipline around a routine, around a process, around a procedure. The one caution I would say with discipline is don't let your uh, comfort with having a, a disciplined routine um, make you afraid uh, of innovating or trying new things. Those are the two balances, right? So um, I, I think of discipline uh, a lot of the time as um, holding on to a core set of beliefs and values and um, trying to emulate that as best as possible every single day, um, but not necessarily as much the process. The process is just how you get to where you want to go based on what you think your goals or values are. So um, so yeah, discipline, extremely important, uh, for most entrepreneurs. I think if you, if you read, uh, interviews or listen to interviews of entrepreneurs that are way more successful than, than, uh, we are at this stage, um, you'll hear about their, um, morning routine. Everyone talks about a morning routine. Like what are the, what time do you wake up at? What are the three things you do before work? Like those are the, the gimmicks that catch headlines, but, um, there is, there is some truth to it. And that really stems from discipline. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, you know, I think, uh, uh, a quote that that might help to to sum up the idea is that entrepreneurs, uh, and and I want to know your opinion on it, but but as entrepreneurs, we need to be rigid in the problems that we're trying to solve, but flexible in how we go about solving them. A hundred percent. Yeah, to totally agree with you. I think um, even even problems that we've been trying to solve for six years. Um, every new employee, I just onboarded a new employee before this interview. Um, yeah, I was telling him a little bit about our culture and I said, I don't want you to come in and just kind of, um, accept the status quo. I want you to challenge things, see what's breaking, see what you think you can improve and always, to, uh, um, you know, take us to the next level as a company. Um, so I think to your point, you have to be flexible in your approach for how you're solving problems. The one thing I'll caveat that with is actually sometimes I think as an entrepreneur, you may realize the problems you're solving aren't actually the right problems to be solving. So I'll give you an example. When we started our company, it's a digital marketing um, uh, technology company. Uh, we were solving problem A because we had experienced problem A and we were really convinced that problem A was the biggest thing in the industry. And so we we're really focused on that. And then as we started talking to more customers that we thought had problem A, we realized that their real problem was problem B. And so we had to change our approach for, okay, take a step back mission of the company is to do something that's bigger than both problem A and B. So we need to be flexible, like you mentioned, in our approach from shifting from what we thought was the problem to what the actual problem or issue is. So now that is a great point. And, and you know, I think a, a term that kind of goes along with that is pivoting. Um, mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, I, I want to talk a little bit about that uh, a, a little later on in the interview. Uh, I want to dive a little bit more into your history. So um, let's talk about your days playing hockey. Um, what made you so attracted to hockey and maybe you could take us through your your chronology of playing the game yeah absolutely um well it's about my dad again um i i do love my mom too sorry i should throw that out there it's not always just about my dad but he so my dad is a uh, french canadian he grew up in canada um national uh sport of canada obviously hockey so not not hard to imagine there um, he got a scholarship, came to the U.S., uh, played professionally overseas in Sweden for a little bit, and then he settled down in Ohio where he met my mom, and obviously that's where I come into the story. Um, so from a very early age, hockey in Ohio wasn't a big thing, but he kind of instilled that in me. Um, and it's like any other childhood. You know, son wants to be like his dad a lot of the time and has uh, shared interests. Um, so for me, he kind of gave me that introduction um, but I think it was really a combination of um, probably innately, but also for my mom, just that competitive spirit. Um, and so, you know, for the first couple of years, I played in the local Columbus area, uh, but very quickly realized that there just wasn't a lot of competition there um, compared to where 
we thought there was the potential for this hockey career to go. Um, so uh, when I was in fifth grade, I moved for the first time to Cleveland um, to go and play for the only um, what's called the AAA team. It's it's the highest amateur level at a certain age group. Uh, the only AAA team in the state at the time. Um, so um, we moved, so we moved to Cleveland Hats. for the Hats. Um, I lived there for a while. Hey, hey, you kind of you kind of yeah. breaking up. Yeah. You kind of breaking up. Uh, Can you still hear me? Uh, there's a there's a little bit of fuzz every time you're every time you're speaking. And I, I, I just see. don't Is that want better to... or worse? Oh, better, better, way better. Better? Okay. I just plugged my headphones in and took them back out. So awesome. <laughs> Solves everything. <laughs> Feel free to let me know if it cuts out again. Yeah, um, absolutely. So can you maybe take that back uh, like 10 to 15 seconds? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, in fifth grade, moved to Cleveland, Ohio for the, the first time to play for the first um, what's called AAA uh, team in the state. AAA is the highest uh level within uh, your age group as an amateur athlete um, in hockey. Um, so did that in fifth grade. I stayed in Cleveland for about nine months or so playing for that top team. Um, and then as an amateur hockey player in the U.S., not to bore you, but there's basically three main areas that you go as a player if you're serious. One is the Northeast in Boston, one is Detroit in uh, Mich Michigan, and one is uh, pretty much the entire state of Minnesota, to be honest, <laughs> but mainly the Twin Cities there. Um, so we got approached by a team in uh, Detroit. It's one of the top two or three teams in the entire country, and they said, we want you to play. Um, and that's really where my, my childhood took a, a turn. So that was in sixth grade that that happened. Lived in Detroit for the next few years playing for teams. Uh, part of it was with just my mom and my two younger brothers at the time. Part of it was me living in just uh, other houses. Uh, my dad commuting up from Ohio a couple of hours on the weekends to come see us. Um, so it was a it was a whole different type of experience that uh, than most of my other friends had. Um, that I think informed a lot of what you were talking about earlier about you know the discipline and just kind of like how that influenced you to become an entrepreneur. Um, at the time when I was in Detroit, um, you know, some scouts saw what we were doing and I had the opportunity to play and represent um, the U.S. in some international competitions. So that's really kind of looking back. Those were some of the most exciting uh, moments of my, you know, young career. Um, we went to uh, St. Petersburg, Russia. We went to Helsinki, Finland. We went to Stockholm twice in, in Sweden um, and competed in these international competitions. Um, sadly, we never the U.S. we never won. We, we got like second and third a couple of times, but um, it was an incredible experience. It gave me early exposure to the world. It taught me how much I loved traveling and how much uh, there was to learn uh, and, and see out there. Um, so that type of exposure early on was incredible. Um, as my time in Detroit was winding down, I decided I wanted to go back to Ohio and there were more AAA teams available now in Ohio. My family wanted to live together in one house. So in ninth grade, we moved to Ohio and I commuted back to Detroit. So I'd go to uh, an all boys high school and then every day uh, or three days a week, I should say, uh, we would drive three hours to Detroit for our hockey practice and then drive three hours back. Um, we'd arrive at one or 2 a.m. Uh, back home and then at 6 a.m. you're up and at him for school. Um, so that was a really tough year. <clears throat> Not surprisingly, the next year I found a team in Ohio <laughs> to play for. Um, and kind of finished up my career there in Ohio. Uh, the last thing I'll say, because I know this has been long-winded, but uh, the uh, the last part of the hockey career was um, in my senior year. Uh, it, 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 it's kind of you were talking about being self-aware, and this is probably one of the hardest self-aware moments for me. I realized that I could be good enough for D1 playing hockey, but there probably wasn't any NHL or professional opportunity past that. Um, and so, uh, I, I stopped, I just cold Turkey, uh, at the end of my senior year, decided to, to hang them up. Um, and that I wanted to use college as a time to prepare for whatever was going to come next. Um, and lo and behold, had no idea it would turn into, uh, into this. And I think that's part of the fun of the entrepreneurship journey. So that is incredible, man. That is so cool. So, you know, now that, now that we've kind of progressed through, through your high school time, um, can you can you talk a little bit more in depth about your time in college and um, just maybe give a little bit of insight about about who you were and, and what you learned and your your main takeaways from that time? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so sadly, my collegiate career lasted three semesters before I dropped out. Um, my co-founder was a couple years older than me, so he was a senior when we left. Um, very early on, I got um, hooked up into the um, so I was in the business school as an undergrad at Boston College. So. 
frankly, I had no idea what type of business I wanted to do. Um, was it finance? Was it accounting, marketing, entrepreneurship was a completely new concept to me. Um, but I spent a lot of time doing, um, uh, these, uh, visits called tech track very early on a couple of friends and I in the business school joined this club and it basically allowed us to go and visit companies in Boston and, and get up close and personal with founders and entrepreneurs. And, you know, it's, it's a class of 20 to 30 kids that goes and visits the Google office in Cambridge, uh, or you go downtown and see uh, Wayfair, a huge startup here in Boston, uh, downtown. And having that type of access to other founders and entrepreneurs, I think really changed my perspective and certainly heightened my level of interest in doing something like this. Um, so in the three semesters I was there, uh, I spent a lot of time taking business courses and as many of these entrepreneurship courses as possible. Um, but it was really about building Jebit. So we built out a, a college like intern team, basically, of 20 to 25 other students. Um, and that's really where like the genius of Tom comes in to be able to have 20 to 25 college students willing to, for little to no money, work at a startup and basically, you know, these five kids are your developers, these five kids are your sales team, you know, these five are your marketing team. So, um, it was really fun. Jebit became kind of like this cult on campus, uh, a little bit, uh, definitely fun for us and probably annoying for, for some people that were on the outside. Um. But kind of how the college career ended and the reason we ended up leaving wasn't because we just decided one morning, you know what, we think this has potential, we're going to drop out. I wish it was that simple. Um, we had participated in a Shark Tank style contest in Boston, not the real Shark Tank, but one that was mimicked off the show. Um, and it had a lot of other famous um, and successful entrepreneurs in the local Boston scene serving as the Sharks. So we applied, we never thought we'd get in, and uh, we were one of a couple of companies that got accepted. And so uh, we basically had the opportunity in front of this huge audience of hundreds of people to, to pitch, just like Shark Tank, just like you see on the show, but to these local Boston icons. Um, at the conclusion of that event, uh, one of the, the most well-known uh, icons, his name is Dharmesh Shaw, he's the founder of a software company called HubSpot. For those of you that aren't familiar with HubSpot, uh, HubSpot IPO'd two years ago and is now worth three or four billion dollars. So he's a very successful guy. Um, Darmesh invested in Jebit on the spot. And so that was an incredible moment where we kind of started to get all of these accolades and kind of this interest from the greater Boston community. And we were just a couple of students from BC. Um, and so from there, we got accepted to a program called Techstars. Techstars is a uh, startup accelerator program. It's just like Y Combinator, Mass Challenge, all of these other programs you hear about. Um, and that's a full-time commitment. And so that we found out over Christmas uh, in 2012 that we got accepted. And so we decided uh, for the uh, winter semester, the second semester there starting in January, that we would uh, not return to school. And um, you know, it started off as a let's see how this goes. And it's ended with a uh, you know, that was four and a half years ago. So <laughs> short, but sweet college career. That's awesome, man. That's awesome. So, you know, from from when you jumped onto the scene, what was Jebit? I mean, you know, at its at its core, what is it, and and what do you what do you sell? What's the beauty of it? I think this goes back to our previous conversation where we're talking about thinking about the bigger mission of the company and then trying to understand the individual problem you're solving. So the mission of Jebit has always been this realization that in the marketing and advertising world, it's very inefficient in terms of how the digital ecosystem has evolved. And it's a lot of brands spending a lot of top dollar, billions of dollars in this ecosystem to push advertising to you to try and kind of force it down your throat. And you're not surprised to see something like ad blockers, almost everyone using them now, right? It's it's in Google Chrome now. You can block all ads, which is incredible for a user. So the original idea was, okay, there's got to be a better way fundamentally to just do this. And so it always started with this idea of attention and interaction. So if we can just sustain someone's attention and in a genuine way try to get them engaged and in interacting with a brand – and it has to be something they care about with the brand and it has to be a brand they care about, maybe there's a way we attach that problem. So to your point, how did Jebit enter the scene? Well, the only way we knew how to start as college students was, well, let's launch a website and let college kids answer questions about brands and, and you know begin some interaction there, right? 
wasn't the whole mission of the company. We knew that wasn't a scalable business, but for other entrepreneurs that are, are thinking about starting a company or are in the early days, one of the biggest lessons we learned is to just go out there and test and try something. Don't wait until you have the perfect product. Don't wait until you know you have that dream investment lined up or that dream customer. Uh, we launched this website. Uh, we didn't have any brands on board, so we went to brands and told them, we're gonna pay for your marketing campaigns and we're gonna run them on this website and we're gonna prove that if you can get, at this time our focus was college students, to answer questions about what you're doing and kind of learn about the new Nike shoes or the new Bose headphones, maybe that's more valuable than just spending another $10 million on pre-roll video ads before YouTube that people ignore, right? So that was kind of the initial idea. That has totally changed, right? And I think the reason it's changed is because we've spent as much time as possible with our customers. So for other entrepreneurs that have an initial product, that have users, whether it's a, a business or whether it's a, you know, a consumer, spend as much time trying to understand what their core problems are that you're solving, and not only the one that you're helping them solve, but all the tangential ones too, because that's really where a lot of the business opportunity comes. So I'll kind of fast forward through the middle stages to where we are today to, to you know, <laughs> avoid all of the different steps and what we learned. But basically, as we started spending more and more time with our consumer, with our customers, we realized two things. One, Jevit had to know what we were uniquely good at as a company and not just trying to do two things, which was capturing an audience of college students and selling brands. So as an entrepreneur, you have to have focus and be the best at one thing. And so for us, that one thing was the software side, or I guess this side. Um, so we decided, you know, screw the audience and, and the college students. We're not going to go out and try and build an audience of users. We're just going to create a software technology that brands will use to push to their audience. Okay, so that was the first big pivot or evolution in Jebit. The second one was what are they actually using the technology for and what does the technology do? So today we solve two problems for our customers. The first is around mobile conversion. So more time than ever before is spent on these devices, right? Everyone has one. When you walk in the elevator, what do you do? When you're in the restroom, what do you do? When you're on the subway, what do you do in line at Starbucks? We're glued to these things. But the way we interact has totally changed it. with it. You only have 30 to 60 seconds at a time. And so brands are struggling today with putting the right type of content. And when I say content, I literally mean like parts of their website and landing pages, that type of content, not the cat videos you see in Facebook. They're struggling to figure out the content that they put on mobile devices. And so Jebit allows them to build and create these very immersive mobile first experiences. And so think of it as almost like it looks a little bit like Snapchat, where it's interactive, there's videos you can swipe through, but it's all about the brand. So the first problem we help them solve is, hey, instead of sending someone to a boring landing page where it's just some images and a form you can fill out, let's send them to this awesome looking mobile experience. So that's the first problem. The second problem is once they launch a bunch of these experience, experiences, we realize there's an opportunity to capture some interesting data on consumers to make those experiences more relevant. So if it's a Nike uh, campaign about the next shoe that's launching or the step, you know, not the Steph Curry shoe because he's uh, Under Armour, but LeBron, I guess, right? So the, the LeBron shoe that's out, maybe in the experience it asks you, hey, Ben, what is your favorite sport or what is your favorite basketball player? They're going to capture that information and the next time you engage with Nike, maybe they're going to have an image of that favorite athlete or uh, icons from that sport uh, that just draw you in a little bit more. Again, it's all about just creating a better, more relevant experience so you don't see crappy advertising and marketing. So um, long-winded way of saying we started off very simple, solving a core problem that we thought was a problem in the only way we knew how, and through just years of continuing to talk to customers and learn and iterate and figure out where the industry was going, we've kind of landed on um, this point where we've been for about two years now and really where the future of the company is, is all around mobile and uh, this data story, so. Wow, that's awesome, that's awesome. So, you know, I wanna, I wanna talk a little bit about uh, understanding customers because it's kind of been a resounding theme uh, throughout the interview. So, you know, I 100% I agree with you that if you're not listening to your customers, the people who are voting for you with their wallet, you're not doing a good enough job, right? So 
how do you actually do that? You know, what are the actionable steps that entrepreneurs can take in order to better understand their customers? Uh, incredible question. Um, if you can nail this, I feel like you can build a pretty good business because it's just the art of listening and being able to take that feedback and put it into action. What I can only share what we did and what we've learned along along the journey. We grabbed as many coffees as possible, or just casual conversations like this with successful entrepreneurs that had built companies in this space with successful, um, you know, our end customer, someone who buys Jebit technology is a marketing person. So even though we weren't trying to sell them, we would grab coffees with chief marketing officers, VPs of marketing, just to better understand, you know, hey, tell me what's going on at work right now. What are your biggest problems? Um, can you talk a little bit about mobile and, and how you're thinking about that? And we basically just try to learn as quickly as possible. So when it comes to understanding your customers, I think you should think of it not as who knows the most on day one when you start your company, but who's willing to learn as much and as quickly as possible. And that team is most likely the one to win, even if you came into an industry and there was someone who knew more than you. So the way we did it was we got a bunch of coffees early on with kind of industry experts and entrepreneurs that had done this well before. Then as we were kind of growing, we continued to do that with just potential customers. But then we started, especially my co-founder and I, we started to spend a ton of time with our customers. So that physically means hopping on a plane, going to San Francisco and sitting down with someone and just grilling them with questions for 30 minutes, being really self-aware and honest about how can we make this technology better for you? What are your biggest problems? What do you like about it? And please tell us what do you hate about it, right? Because that's that's the type of honest feedback you, know, you just gotta love as an entrepreneur. Um, and that's continued today. So the next level of that is instilling your management team and then the team under them to really continue that just really self-aware culture of brutal, honest feedback from customers and spending as much time as possible. Um, so this week alone, we had uh, people on our customer uh, success team um, in Texas, in Atlanta, in LA, in New York City, all over meeting with customers. And sometimes those meetings are just strategy focused, how can you use the technology? But we always try to incorporate with every touch point a question about how their business is doing and, and understanding that side of it better or understanding how we can better serve them as a technology. So that's awesome. That's awesome, man. So, you know, I want to I want to talk a little bit about uh, about mobile and, and mm -hmm. how important that is for entrepreneurs to, to really be aware of. Right. So, you know, if, if you could just give a little bit of insight on the importance of, of truly being mobile first and, and you know maybe it isn't mobile first I, I'm not sure I, you know you're the expert so I want to ask you should should entrepreneurs be going for a mobile first approach or how should they be dealing with mobile versus uh, versus desktop yeah absolutely um, I think at the core of it what what when we have this discussion it's really about where is the attention of the people that you're trying to capture the attention of right so whether it's customers or users whoever it is if their attention is on mobile, which the blanket statement for most people today is yes, it is on mobile, then yes, go all in on mobile first. But if you look at the evolution of these devices over time, we started with radio, then TV came along, you know, you know, a certain number of years later, then the internet came and desktop and kind of big standalone devices came, then it was tablets and then it was mobile. You have to be intellectually honest enough to understand that mobile is just a phase that we're in as well, right? Not saying that mobile devices are going to become obsolete, but as things like smartwatches, IoT, AR and VR type experiences become more prevalent in the consumer world, where you have to focus your strategy and where you try to capture attention needs to shift as well. So frankly, the reason we care about mobile today and, and companies do is because that's where everyone spends their time. But five years from now, I suspect that that actually won't be as true. There will be more devices that we're connected to and leveraging to interact with. And so companies are going to need to think about what the next set of devices are and how to you know, kind of quickly adjust on the fly. So short answer for most people today, yes, absolutely be mobile first, but just always think about where people are actually uh, spending their time and their attention. And that's where you want to be. That's awesome. That's great insight, man. Thank you. And, and I really do appreciate all the value that you've been providing so far. Uh, it's, it's truly refreshing to, to, you know, 
hear all this stuff. So it's great. Thanks. So <laughs> you, you mean you mean you don't like to hear people just talk about themselves sometimes? <laughs> that, that I mean, I love it. I, I find it. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm teasing. <laughs> I, I, I totally get it. <laughs> so, uh, you know, we talked a little bit about your past, and uh, you know, I want to talk about uh, the the current moment, right? Um, what is your biggest focus as of right now? So we're at an exciting point as a company. Uh, we're about to close our next round of venture capital funding. Um, you know, normally I'm a pretty honest and transparent guy, but this is kind of like the one in part of the business where you're not really supposed to talk a ton about it publicly until you're allowed to. Um, so long story short, we're, we're on the precipice of that. And so you asked what I'm most focused on right now. It's basically what are the next two years for Jebit look like? And I mean that in terms of what is our product? How does that continue to evolve in working with the product team? Really, it's people, to be honest. We're going to have to grow from about 35 people as a company to 100 in the next two years. And so I'm doing a ton of interviewing. I'm doing a ton of, you know, just trying to figure out how do you scale a team, you know, looking at a new office, like all just the dumb stuff that goes with being an entrepreneur that you have to do because no one else is there to do it. Um, but the biggest thing I'm focused on right now, I guess, is um, how do you continue to bring really intelligent, hardworking, just high quality people to your company, keep them motivated and allow them to continue to grow as people and as employees. Because at the end of the day, if they're not growing and learning and being challenged, but in a good way, it doesn't matter what you do or how well you pay them, they're going to leave. Um, so I think really right now it's about keeping the current team, uh, motivated and continuing to grow in their development and, uh, recruiting, interviewing a lot of people. So fantastic. Fantastic. So, you know, besides Jebit, what else are you are you truly focused on and and you know that could be inclusive of of the past couple of years as well you know what has it been really the biggest focus for Jonathan mhm mm i this is really where i've gotten a ton of incredible advice from other entrepreneurs that have gone through this so my mentality when we started jebit was you know you got to work as hard as possible you're putting in 18 20 hour days every days and every day and you just got to go for it so it was like a sprint about a year and a half, two years in, I kind of I kind of burned myself out, right? Because you can only work that hard for that long. And I realized that you need a better balance in life. So not saying that we work less hard now. I think we just change up our work habits to allow us to be more efficient and successful. So what did I introduce outside of Jebit that made me have, uh, you know, I don't like the word balance because we're all connected every day. And so you're working from home or from work or on the go everywhere. But it allowed me to have um, more completeness and, and, and feel more fulfilled, I guess is a better way to say it. So the one big thing that was missing after hockey was a really physically demanding um, sport or exercise that I could just really, you know, jump into and be excited about. Um, and I actually found that during my college days, Boston College has a marathon team, uh, marathon club team. It wasn't varsity, obviously. And um uh, just started running that. So freshman year, I ran the Boston Marathon and the Cleveland Marathon. Sophomore year, I ran the Boston Marathon and a couple others. And, um, you know, uh, was fortunately or unfortunately part of that uh, 2013 Boston Marathon bombing uh, experience. I just finished uh, the marathon. I was on the Boylston Street in Boston when, when the bombs went off. And so I was there. I saw it. I, I kind of witnessed it. Totally OK, obviously. But that kind of gave me a lot of motivation to think about the bigger picture in the world. And so that was kind of a transformative moment for me. Um, and so it has propelled me to run marathons all the time. So that's what I enjoy doing the most out of work. I enjoy just going for a long run, kind of thinking about the day or thinking about the week. Um, I've run 17 marathons the past couple of years, and it allows me to see new parts of the world, you know, Iceland, Paris, LA, San Francisco, New York City, right? So it just kind of is that awesome combination of anytime you're stressed after work, go for a run, you can do it by yourself. Um, but also, you know, kind of building up for these like bigger moments that you can go and travel and all the excitement and the energy around. So I'm a little bit of an adrenaline junkie. So I like that stuff. Um, that's mainly it. The second thing that kind of, um, I think a lot of entrepreneurs struggle with, to be honest, is, uh, feeling like, you know, especially as millennials, we're always focused on making the world a better place, right? We're, we're very, that's one of the best things about our generation is we're focused on the bigger picture. But many of us don't really have an impact at all on the world on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, we're thinking about 
what am I doing in my current role that actually makes this place better? You're reading all the terrible news and, and events in the Middle East or terrorist attacks in Europe, and you're just kind of thinking, what can I do to make this world a tiny bit better? Um, and for most of us, that's a difficult question when you're building a company because you have to be so self-absorbed and self-interested in making your thing successful. So that allowed me to develop kind of the, the third column, Jebit being first, marathon running being second, this third column of uh, where I spend my time. And so I got introduced to a group here in Boston. It's the United Nations group, and they have a local uh, chapter, essentially. Each United Nations has chapters all over the world. Um, and I serve on their board of directors. And so a lot of what we do tactically is just, you know, if you were in school and you ever did the model United Nations or model UN programs, those are the organizations that support it. Uh, but on a bigger level, we try to work with, you know, the Boston mayor's office here, the governor's office. There's been a lot of material the last six months to work with in terms of, uh, <laughs> current, uh, U S politics to, uh, try and bring self, uh, uh, you know, try to bring awareness and enlightenment to in certain areas. So, um, so that's really something else that I've enjoyed doing. And, and even though it's a local chapter and even though it's only Boston, um, you know, it, it allows me to at least channel a little bit of that ambition to try to make the world just a tiny little bit better if it's not through, you know, uh, marketing software. So <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome, man. That that is so cool. So you know, you said that that you really spend your time in those those three columns, right? Jebit, marathons, and 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 your UN thing. Um, so how do you how do you make sure that you don't spread yourself too thin? Because I feel like as entrepreneurs, we have to wear a lot of different hats, and we have to be like you were saying on all the time. And you know, we got to stay in good physical health. We got to stay in good mental health. We got to be learning. We have to be growing. We have to be doing all these things. How do you how do you manage your time? How do you how do you make sure that you don't get overwhelmed? Absolutely. Um, biggest skill and competitive advantage if you can nail it. Hardest thing most entrepreneurs struggle with: time management. Right? Where do you spend your time? You've probably heard this one before, but I I think it it just resonates so well with me. There are five areas you could spend your time family, friends, health, sleep, and work, and you can only pick three of them. And, and I, I, I couldn't agree more with it. You can only do three of those five really well. And so for me, most of the ones that um, you know fall a lot of the time, to be honest, are um, sleep and uh, friends. And so those are kind of the, you, you kind of have to be uh, flexible there. Um, but I think getting back to your question, the way I've thought about it is if you're gonna sign up for something outside of your core focus, um, allowing it to be flexible enough to adapt to the times uh, that you need to be able to do that activity. So I'll, I'll give you an example. With marathon running or with some type of physical activity, the reason I enjoy it, part of the reason I enjoy it so much is because it's not super structured. It's not at 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. every day you have practice or you have games at these times, right? Really the only time that is structured for a marathon runner is the actual day of the race. And normally that's at 7 a.m. on a Saturday to noon. So, you know, that's not a, a, a huge in-demand time period for most people. Um, so having something, whatever that extra thing is, be really flexible and you can adapt to it no matter where you are, no matter what time of day it is, um, I think is really probably the only way I've been able to try and balance these things. The other thing I'll mention is just having people around you that will keep you honest about if you're overextending yourself. So it's a good balance that Tom and I have too is if he thinks I'm spending a little bit more time on non jebit activities or he has other non jebit activities he's involved in as well, we keep each other in check and say, hey, look, I know things have been busy, but we really need you at the business right now. So let's take a step back a little bit and focus on that. It's always good to have someone there to just bounce your your priorities off of. So it's something he and I have both done before. Very cool. Very cool, man. So, you know, you, you were talking a little bit earlier about how when you got that initial investment um, from the gentleman from HubSpot, uh, you started getting a bunch of different accolades and you started being recognized for things. Well, what would you say uh, both you know, yourself and, and Jebit uh, have been some of the biggest accolades that y'all have been recognized for so far? Um, so the one that most people associate us with is obviously the Forbes 30 under 30. That's, that's just an easy moniker um, to, to kind of remember. The thing I'm most proud about that, though, I think, is the fact that um, 
here's what I'll say about it. So Tom and I were the youngest ones on the list when it came out for that particular year, 2015. I'm sure there have been younger people since then or before then uh, for young people, right? <laughs> uh, but that was 100% a team effort, right? Tom and, uh, Tom and I can be um, as entrepreneurially you know, successful as, as you want to paint us to be. But if we're not actually building something that's worth anything, there's no Forbes 30 under 30. There's none of these other accolades. And that really comes back to the team. Without having an incredible team, the people that they don't get the recognition or accolades that they always deserve, but you know your, your founding team and your kind of first layer of managers and management team, those are the people that allow us as a company to really be successful and to see things like Forbes 30 under 30. So from an individual standpoint, obviously that's the great one. That's the one that you know your grandma's proud of and, and stuff like that. Uh, but from a company standpoint and from, from what we've accomplished as a team, there are two that really stick out. One was CNBC. They said, uh, no idea how we snuck in on this one, but they were they, they came up with a list of the 50 most promising companies in the world. Uh, this was back in the early days uh, when we had just started kind of the mobile data focus. So they thought what we were doing was really cool, which was a nice accolade. Um, and then the other one was just in the state of Massachusetts, which is probably the second largest startup community in the U.S. outside of Silicon Valley in California. Um, Jebit was awarded as the most innovative company in, in all of technology um, a couple of years ago. And so, you know, it's kind of, again, ups and downs of a startup. You know, you can go through some really rough periods, but these accolades, I think, just represent not the highs, but what happens if you consistently come in every single day, just keep chugging along, keep grinding, and eventually, you know, a Forbes 30 under 30 looks like a, a breakout success when really that was five years of hard work, putting your head down, just continuing to crank and, you know, getting no recognition for that. So hopefully, hopefully that, that makes sense. sense. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and congratulations on all those things, man. That is truly incredible. That is awesome. So, you know, we talked a little bit about your past and, uh, you know, we talked about what you're doing now, but I want to talk about the future, uh, both, both personally and professionally for, for Jonathan. Where do you, where do you see yourself going uh, a little bit down the road? It's such an interesting question, um, and, and I say it's interesting because it's it's something that, as entrepreneurs, you want to plan for, but also at the same time, it's kind of in your DNA to to just know that whatever you plan isn't going to happen, right? Um, I've been spending a lot of time recently thinking about what's next after Jebit, um, not because I don't enjoy Jebit, not because it's going extremely well, not because we're not going to do it for a few more years, but... I think, again, because kind of of uh, as I take a step back and look at the bigger picture of the world, uh, just thinking about areas that interest me. Um, so for any entrepreneur that's currently working on a business, one small thing that I do that maybe you might consider doing, too, um, is anytime you're on an airplane and there's no Wi-Fi, which unfortunately still happens <laughs> a good number of time, um, or you're on a train and you're in a situation where you just have a few minutes, um, just pull out a notepad or just open up notes on your laptop and just try to think of the five to ten craziest ideas that you can think of uh, that you don't think someone's working on now or areas that you think are super interesting. Um, and keep building that list for a period of time and then uh, start to narrow it down and start to really research and understand what you think are some areas of interest. So the reason I bring that up is I've been doing that for a couple of years now. And so there's a couple of areas where there, I don't have any qualifications to start a company there. I, I know very little about it when I started, but I've basically just spent time researching it. Um, so one is asteroid mining, right? Elon and Jeff Bezos are going to make it cheaper than ever before to get into space. What do we do once we're there? How do we get to Mars, right? All of those kind of next level questions. And we have more resources than, uh, I think people realize floating around us in space in these asteroids. We have sophisticated technology on earth to get valuable resources from below, uh, you know, uh, dozens of miles below Earth's surface. The technology exists today to be able to do that on asteroids. We just need to connect the two, get there and do it. So it's stuff like that where you ask about what's my future self doing. Part of me wants to think that, you know, after, you know, Jebit will grow, it'll be successful. We'll spend maybe the next, you know, three, five, 10 years on it. That's hard to say. But inevitably, at some point after that, after a little time off and travel, I'm going to want to jump in and do another company. And the big question that I've been thinking about right now is, is what is that? And that's truthfully the most exciting and difficult thing about entrepreneurship is you don't always know what that is. Um, and so asteroid mining, I gave as an example of just one of the two or three things that I've been starting to research and try and think a little bit more about and try and see how, you know, 
ridiculously crazy that is to think about. So <laughs> that's awesome, man. That is really cool. So, you know, I, I want to kind of uh, go into a little bit more lighter uh, questions just for just for a little bit. Um, so there could be a little, little bit more rapid fire. So you ready for it? Sounds good. Yeah. yeah. All let's right, go. let's do it. So <laughs> if you could go back to any time period, uh, when would you go to and why? In my life or in human history? Any time in, in the history of, of where we are, you know, to not just human history. Uh, the Renaissance, um, because of the incredible amount of um, uh, h- history changing people that were all there at once, and I would love to meet them and ask questions. All right. Well, if you could go and talk to anybody, past, present, or future, who would that be, and what would you talk about? I probably would want to talk to, um, in the future, the first person who, um, not the first person on Mars, but the first person who kind of really establishes the, the Mars colony or, or, or whatever, whatever that attribute would be, whether it's, you know, the first, inevitably there's going to have to be a country and some type of organization on Mars, right? So, you know, the founder of a new country, I don't, I don't know if that can be a thing, but um, I think some someone who has uh, interplanetary exploits and kind of conquests, um, you know, the first person to interact with uh, another uh, species of life um, would definitely want to talk to them. <laughs> very cool. Very cool. So if you could be an animal besides a human, what type of animal would you be and why? Um Part of me wants to just say a cheetah because that would really help with the whole running thing. <laughs> that would be a little bit of an advantage. Um, yeah, let's stick with cheetah. Cheetah, yeah, fast for running. running. Very cool, very cool. So if you had to be on stage singing karaoke style a song <laughs> for 10 million people, what song would you choose to sing? Oh man, uh, going back to my childhood, I, I think it's probably got to be something from the Backstreet Boys or NSYNC. I think it's just one of those throwback classics. So I don't know if it's uh, Bye 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 or if it's one of those, but uh, um, yeah, probably probably a Backstreet Boys or an NSYNC song. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. So if you were running a marathon and you had to put together your team of fellow runner all-stars, who would they be? Who would be on your team? Um, so the way I would actually try and do it is I would view it as a marathon is a four hour chunk of time where you're stuck doing the same thing with people. So I would try and find on the spectrum of really interesting people, but also very athletically inclined, just people to do it with. Right. Um, so that may be, uh, very successful athletes in the past, like a Michael Jordan or, or like a Wayne Gretzky or someone like that. Um, uh, but I would also try to find someone like, uh, president Obama or politicians that, um, you could kind of uh, bring into just like this really interesting group of athletes and politicians and scientists and you know just maybe maybe we would add um, Kara Goucher. She's a marathon runner and um, she's just really inspiring for uh, for women's rights and feminism and uh, and just marathon running in general. So um, kind of a combination of all of those, I guess. Very cool. Very cool. So if you were to uh, say your perfect day, like plan out your perfect day, what would that look like? I think right now where I'm at the perfect day is, uh, the, the, uh, best combination of waking up, going on an incredible run, beautiful weather, um, you know, uh, showering, getting some coffee in. I'm a, I'm a caffeine addict, so you got to have coffee early on. That makes a perfect day. Um, you go to work and every, and everyone you interact with at work is happy. I think that's what would be best at its core. It's not about like some individual, individual conquest that day. Obviously I'd love to go in and a perfect day would be signing the biggest customer ever or getting a huge investment or striking some new huge partnership. Um, but it would just be about everyone you interact with that's working on the same thing you are is just genuinely really ecstatic and happy. And I think being able to fuel off that energy would be perfect. Um, I do love to travel though. So maybe a perfect day in the future would be 
you know, being able to wake up, start in our Boston office, have a couple meetings in our New York office and end the day in San Francisco at a different office of Chebit, you know, like that would be, that would be kind of cool at some point, but as long as everyone's energized and pumped, I think that's what's most important. Very cool. Very cool, man. So, you know, I want to, I want to go a little bit, a little bit more back to the, to the personal side. Um, if, if you were to describe yourself to somebody else, how would you describe yourself? Um, probably, uh, the French Canadian in me would say uh, passionate first. I wear my heart on my sleeve. Um, so like very passionate about what I work on and, and who I do it with. Um, hopefully hardworking and kind of determined is uh, an attribute that most entrepreneurs have. Um, intellectually curious. That's not something that's always been there for me, but, uh, over the past few years, I've really tried to spend time just thinking about these problems and, and asking the tough questions and, I think you have to do that if you want to be successful. Um, and, and hopefully just uh, a really good um, like support network uh, or, or person of support for uh, coworkers and friends that are going through a tough time um, or if they have a problem, someone they can turn to and just have a conversation with. So um, hopefully a combination of the above. Fantastic, man. Well, uh, I do want to thank you so much for jumping on the interview today. It has been uh, you know, an honor to speak to you and, and a ton of fun for me. I hope you've had a great time as well. Um, I just have uh, one more question for you. So uh, is there anything about yourself that you think is an important part of who you are that I did not ask you about today? In other words, what did I miss? Um, so the only thing I'll say here that I think can apply to everyone is um, there have been some really difficult moments in life with the passing of people that you really care about or just really low lows. Um, it's not about if you're able to avoid those in life. It's about what you do immediately afterwards. Um, so I think the biggest one of the biggest things I've learned over the past couple of years and when there's been a couple of uh, deaths that have been really close to us that have really hurt and brought you down. Um, it's about uh, how you respond to that and how you try to embody that person or how you try to um, make an impact on the bigger world. Um, and that's just what I would encourage everyone to do. So no matter how big or small you think your you know, bad day is, um, just think about how you can make the next one a little bit better and, and how you can, um, you know, if it was a person that passed away, uh, maybe embody and continue their work in the world that uh, you know they were working on. So. Absolutely. Well, Jonathan, again, thank you so much for coming on the interview. I really do appreciate your time. And to everybody who's listening, thank you so much. Uh, you know, the, the fact that you all come and support, um, you know, week after week and, and show after show, I mean, it's incredible. And, and I, I love you very much. And I thank you so much for your time. So everybody, this has been another Project Egg interview. Today, we've been talking to Jonathan Lacoste from Ohio. Let's build a better world together.